Hey folks, we're here with uh, Flight Lieutenant John John, uh, John Jenkins, and uh, sorry, sorry about that, John, and also with uh, Flying Officer Stephanie Hall. Yeah, I get that right. Yes. Yep. Yeah, cool. And we're in front of uh, Australia's, the Air Force's first uh, remotely piloted or unmanned vehicle, and that's the Heron, not the Mick Heron, like my name. That's the Heron. <laughs> So uh, we're going to look yeah. at renaming that though at the end of the show, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to, yeah. We're going to be calling this the McCarran. The McCarran, yeah, that's right. Getting lesions on the side. There you go. <laughs> now um, this aircraft is uh, this is the first time it's ever been on display to the public. It is indeed. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, first time in Australia. Uh, okay. In Tommy. Um, with the view to uh, doing our flying training here. Yep. So uh, this is part of the process. It'll be on display here until the end of the week, and then we'll be moving it to uh, Woomera, where we're okay. going to do our uh, practical training for the next guys going out okay. to uh, operations. Now, John, um, you've been involved with the aircraft in Afghanistan, I understand. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, came back in December from uh, operations. Okay. And uh, what was it you were, your involvement with the Heron? Uh, for my involvement, then um, part of the recruitment process is uh, to get the crews who actually fly the system. Yep. And then in the back end, then we've got uh, the guys who do the intelligence kind of uh, aspects of the operation. Analysis, so analyzing uh, the data. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And um, my role is as the payload operator, which is sitting alongside the AVO, yep. who's uh, the uh, vehicle operator. Yep. Um, so effectively, pilot and nav, if you like, yep. on the bread of wood, uh, operating the, uh, the sensors as it were. Okay. Cool. And uh, so, how long have you been doing that with the Heron? Uh, literally started drone school training in January last year and uh, practical training started in July okay. and then into theatre and then came out at uh, the end of the year last year. Uh, what's, what's your background with the, the RAF? Uh, did you, come, you didn't come straight on the Heron? What did you... No, um, my background is uh, came over from the UK uh, Air Force yep. with um, Tornado GR4s as a okay. navigator um, okay. and then recruited across laterally into the uh, RAAF yep. and was uh, teaching down at... Um, School of Air Warfare in uh, RAF Base East Sale. Okay. Uh, baby navs, in fact. Cool. Yeah, making making new navs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, with your with your work on the aircraft, uh, so you you've got an understanding of how it is to actually fly it as well. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, effectively, the uh, the PO and the AVO operate as a typical uh, crew. Yeah. So we're very akin to a fast jet crew. Okay. Uh, also akin to um, captain and co-pilot. Okay. So uh, as the PO is maybe doing the sensor stuff, but certainly on um, startup, taxi takeoff, etc., doing the standard co-pilot kind of uh, okay. roles and responsibilities. Okay. And it's how automated is it from um, startup to landing? Um, the, the startup is pretty much the same as a normal aircraft. So you're going through the same routine, same checks, aircraft yeah. walk-arounds. Um, yeah check of all the systems, built-in tests, etc. So uh, very similar. Yeah. Um, you've got grown crew that are remotely uh, with the aircraft outside the hangar whilst you're in the control cabin. Okay. Um, you've got camera on board which uh, sits at the rear of the aircraft so you can actually view the engine area okay. so you can monitor yourself but uh, you're in radio contact with the guys on the ground. Yep. Um, startup is as per any normal aircraft. Traditionally yep. then they will then tow it to a handover point yep. of which then you'll take full control of the taxi and aspects of it okay. uh, in the cabin cool. uh, and then you'll taxi the last you know a few hundred meters maybe a kilometre yep. uh, lining up onto the runway yep. and then it's uh, pretty much an automated takeoff okay. uh, which is built into the system uh, and then you fly it uh, manually then to a uh, one of your first waypoints and then going on to your route okay cool. now Steph what's your role here with the with the Heron I'm the logistics officer so that has a lot to do with the fact that the Heron's here today yep. in that we are uh, packed it into a shipping container and brought it out from Israel on a on a flight. Okay, so tell us about the procedure that you have to go through to get it packed up and shipped over here from the, from actually, the Far East, <laughs> or the Mid-East, I guess. It has a specially designed shipping container that it fits into, uh, and it's all packed up into pieces. So, for example, this wing pops off and breaks into two pieces and fits into the shipping container on a rack. Um, so once we packed it all up, we uh, chartered a flight from Tel Aviv, where the aircraft would normally live, and then um, went through all the customs procedures and the like, and then uh, flew it out here, flew it to Sydney, uh, from where we popped it on a truck to bring it down here. Cool. Okay. And assembled it. And then assembled it, which was fabulous. <laughs> now you say it's based in the Middle East, that's obviously because our Air Force is operating and our Defence Force are operating in Afghanistan and, and around that region. Is that the reason it's based there at the moment? Is that that's the most logical place for you to have it based? It very much is. The kind of work that they're doing with the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, it's really just needed there. Yep. And uh, we were training in Canada, but we've moved it to Australia now for our training in Woomera. Yeah, well, we'll have a talk about that in a minute because it's uh, really interesting in itself that it's out there at the old rocket range, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, uh, now flying this aircraft, now you said you worked on uh, tornadoes, so... Um, 
learning to fly this sort of aircraft, what sort of challenges did that present for you to transition over to this? Um, I think with a, obviously a normal aircraft, you've got the kind of seat of the pants feeling, so um, having that awareness, you know, engine noise changes, etc., that kind of uh, routine that you, you process you go through, you, you're a lot more hands-on. So sat remotely in a cabin has got its own challenges. So if, you know things like uh, problems with the engine, you, know, you don't get that feel, the vibration, the noise, the traditional things. You know, if it's going to uh, the buffet, you, know, you don't get really get that those sensations. So it requires a, a lot more um, awareness and monitoring. Um, all the principles are still the same, though, really. Um, it's, I would say it's akin to again a fully automated sort of you know, autopilot system on a, any other aircraft. And do they simulate uh, like in the you know in the, the flight sim world force feedback through a PC? Is there there's some sort of um, haptic sort of feel to the um, to the controls as you're using them, are they any sort of feedback like that? No, not at all. Um, so it really is keeping your eyes glued on the panel, watching the indications, looking for uh, general warnings. Yep. Yeah, so as I said, a lot more monitoring required. Um, it's very reliable, it's uh, very automated as well, so there's a, you know, it's not as intense necessarily yeah. as it can be, um, which allows you to concentrate on the operational role as well. Yeah. So I guess uh, probably like, like any modern aircraft, the, the Day to day, for the most of the flying would be done automatically. You could set some sort of mission profile to it and exactly, send it yeah. off and do that for you. We tend to fly it uh, a lot more manually rather than because uh, effectively you could uh, set up a route from departure, let it automatically take off, follow the route. You can input uh, altitude, speeds, etc., whatever requirements you require. Um, so you could run the whole thing automatically. But the, for the, to achieve the operational tasking that we have, it's a lot more hands on. To, uh, to get the, the frame in the right area, to get the sensors on the ground, which is just providing the support they should do. Yep. Now, one of the things that's come up with uh, these kind of aircraft is they've got long loiter time, they've got their sensors operating, yep. they're bringing in a lot of data, and Absolutely. it's over a long amount of time, and yep. it's the, the fact that you're sitting there for a long time, and that there's so much data to analyze. Mm. How are you addressing those, those aspects? Um, again, kind of alluded to it uh, earlier on, so we've got the crew operating the, the UAV in effectively a cockpit environment yeah. in the cabin. Uh, attached to that, then we've got a uh, another area where uh, we've got uh, imagery analysts and uh, intellos uh, who are operating, and they're doing the, the real-time assessments on the, the feed that we're producing. So you, you're working together as a, a team, uh, very much one crew, uh, as a flying crew in all respects. So uh, the amount of data that's coming in is being processed in the uh, the other room, yep. uh, and then being forwarded on to the, uh, the customer as required. Okay. And, and what's the duration, typical duration of a mission? Is it hours well, or lots of hours? Yeah, typically we we'll be operating anywhere from you know 10 to 20 hours. Yeah. Uh, on average, probably in the area of 14 to 20. Yep. at least. Um, it's been known uh, in other missions to have been up for just over 30 hours. Okay. So it's got uh, quite a capability so you, in terms of endurance. You'd be tag teaming on the ground Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of tag teaming. Yeah. 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 So it, it is kind of different to also to being in, the, you know, like in a um, tornado or anything like that and that you can go, well, I'm going to go get a coffee. It'd be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is, that is a, a, a sheer luxury. Um, <laughs> at the same time, when you're actually flying the thing, so you've got a lot of backup as well if there are problems yeah. you can get that uh, extra bit of expert knowledge technicians etc because yeah. the cockpit is on the ground yeah. that uh, itself brings uh, a lot of benefits to, okay. to the system uh, and again as I said makes it extremely reliable okay awesome now, Steph, tell us about Woomera. We uh, mentioned that earlier on. Uh, you said you're heading out there to, to way out to the outback to uh, to do some testing. What's involved with uh, what you guys get up to out there? We're actually very excited about it because it's um, for the first time we're deploying like a regular manned squadron because so we're uh, sending down admin support and tech support, logistics, uh, instructors, ops and plans. Uh, we're all going down there and flying like a regular unit except for the part where all of our air crew are students. Yep. And they have civilian Canadian instructors. Okay. So we are up and we're moving down there as a big group and it'll be like a, a giant exercise, really. Yeah, that'll be a good challenge for you. Yeah. So the air crew will all be doing their practical training. They've already done four weeks of theory training to be the AVO or PO, yep. the pilots and the NAVs. And they are going to start with the basics of flying and then closer to the end we'll be doing some ISR simulation type activities as well. Mm. Excellent. So um, it sounds like it's quite an abbreviated, or not abbreviated, but a lot, lot of shorter training program than some of your more traditional type uh, platforms that would have been operated on the past. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes, a lot, a lot of that is because um, the crews that we choose are experienced, very experienced aviators in, uh, in all cases. 
Um, the system itself is uh, reasonably intuitive as a flying system, so uh, that enables us to, to reduce the training um, regime as, as such. And an interesting point just going on with that too is that it didn't take long from the time this program was established to the time you got airborne and got operating, was it? It was quite a quick uh, transition. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk Very about quick. That? Yeah. <laughs> I think... Uh, I think the exact dates were roughly around about the August time in terms yes. of capability was uh, identified. August and then, 09. And up and flying by uh, you know, the beginning of January the following year. So you know, less, less than six months. Now we did do a bit of work with the Canadians. Uh, as you said, we've got Canadian instructors and so on. So uh, if it was identified in August 09, but uh, were people with the Canadians getting up to speed before that? Or? Yeah, part of the, uh, the introduction process before we actually got our own uh, airframe was yeah. to uh, get the guys inducted into the system. And the, the easiest way to do that was to integrate with the Canadians who were already operating in theatre. Okay. Uh, and that allowed us to get uh, some corporate knowledge from those guys bring our guys up to speed and then uh, achieve the the operation task in ourselves. Okay. Now, how you, you, you're bringing in a lot of existing air crew, uh, people who have been flying other aircraft and so on, coming across. How are they going on the transition from, you know, I'm a, I'm a you know, combat jet pilot or I'm a you know, heavy vehicle pilot and in the cockpit and out there and up, up in the air and now I'm sitting on a desk? There's a, there's a few giggles going through training, but uh, <laughs> generally speaking, they take it in their stride. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's got its own unique, unique challenges. So uh, you know, whilst you may be you know vaulting around in a you know, a hornet or whatever, but uh, this thing has got its unique challenges. And, you know, can bite you back. And there's an avi- aviator. It's, it's got its uh, you know its, its tasks are so varied as well and slightly okay. different that um, it keeps them interested. Um, okay. A lot of their experience they've got before with operating with uh, you know in a combat environment yeah. applies equally as to to the ISR platform as it yeah. does to any other platform. Yeah, I am hearing through. Um, discussions with uh, people doing a lot of this work with the states and so on as well that, mm. that there's a lot of benefit from having an experienced person systems operator and things like that available to interpret what's going on and, and be able to look at yeah. things and not just leave it all to the computers absolutely it's yeah. that depth of knowledge that uh, comes in handy when you know tasks change yeah so if you go off a routine task then yeah i mean you can take uh, you know all sorts of levels of standards, I suppose, but when you're actually trying to apply it properly, yeah. uh, and obviously when you're dealing with guys on the ground, it's uh, absolutely essential you get it right. Okay. And how does this aircraft interface, with, interact with other aircraft in the area? For instance, I take it you're not working in your own in your own strip, you're working at an airstrip with lots of other aircraft? And Kandahar is yeah. the busiest single exactly. runway single airstrip most busiest in the world. So, <laughs> and you are, also about that. You're working out of Kandahar. So. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's got its difficulties in own right, because uh, with it being an automated takeoff and landing, um, it takes a little bit of time on the runway. It's not just an immediate uh, line up and roll. Um, and obviously, with it being so busy, we've got a lot of uh, heavy transport aircraft uh, in and out of there, so that's got its problems as well. Uh, wake turbulence, etc. Um, just the density. Uh, priorities, again, become an issue as to you know, who's the important one. And a little UAV sort of lining up is not necessarily going to take priority over an Antonov coming in. But, uh, um, yeah, we integrate fairly fairly easily. The air traffic guys are um, very experienced in operating covered, uh, fixed wing aircraft. Uh, rotary wing is a huge uh, input yeah. over there. Again, trying to separate from those guys. And uh, there are multiple UAVs there, so uh, they're very very well versed in coordinating the whole thing. Very busy airspace. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now just before we finish up here, now when you talk about UAVs, of course, most people are maybe looking at the Global Hawks and the, the more turbine powered ones. But this one's propeller driven. Can we talk a bit about? Uh, uh, in general terms, I guess, about uh, how it's powered and yeah. all that sort of stuff. It's a fairly um, robust, simple uh, Rotax uh, engine. It's a 115 horsepower, I believe. Yep. Piston engine. Piston engine, yep. absolutely. Um, so, very simple <laughs> process, to be honest. Nothing uh, high tech to it? Yep. Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, and that's yeah, one of the easy parts of the training is completely up to those things. Obviously, all our parts have trained on piston engines before throughout the normal basic training. So, uh, coming back to this is is all had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one question for you, Steph. Uh, your background coming into the RAF, how, how did you go about uh, joining and uh, what path did you want to, did you, what did you have your goals? And... I, um, I went through the Australian Defence Force Academy yep. and I studied the business degree that they offer there okay. to become a logistics officer. Cool. So um, we should have you come and work for us. We can use someone <laughs> of those skills. Doing the books, huh? Yeah. Um, Making so sure we don't forget things. There is part of a degree we learn about military logistics, transport, freight, warehousing, contracts, yeah. those sorts of subjects that really apply for a, yeah. a job like the Heron. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. So after a brief posting to F-111s, I uh, moved on to the Heron at the start of 2010. Okay. When we first got it, and um, yep. it's been just so interesting to get involved in 
in the UAS scene. Yeah, okay, well, it's all new technology. Well, also, a lot, a lot of people think, you know, all they think about is the aircraft, they think pilot, they think uh, maintainer. You know, air crew, they, they forget that there's a, a huge administration, logistics and health and everything that goes to support. There's way more to do with the Absolutely. Air Force. There's so much more to it, especially in Kandahar. You, know, you need your hangars, you need your taxiway space, you need yeah. somewhere to store, somewhere for maintenance, um, all the supplies, all the in-crew rations, all those sorts of aspects that we have a logistics officer based in Kandahar yeah. to meet those requirements. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you both and we really appreciate you taking the time to have a, a bit of a chat to us about this magnificent piece of machinery. It does look a bit weird without a cockpit on it. It's strange. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it, does, it does look a little odd. I, I've got to say, it's not quite, not quite uh, what you expect, but you know, it is the way of the future. And for, especially for ISR, the, it's the loiter capability and the, the, just the ability to hang out. Better start getting used to it. Yes. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, well they, they do say that the last fighter pilot has already been born. <laughs> the last one that actually sits in the aircraft. And, you know, they're, they're working on uh, automated transports and uh, the Yanks are working on some automated helicopters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They'll just reprovision and go out and yeah, so it's the way of the future. Thanks Absolutely. for coming so, to check out our aircraft cool. today. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks for having us. Okay.